to a new series looking um, pretty much dealing with the plan of salvation and also the Christian the Christian walk and we want to take time to really delve into this topic I call this series to finding the path to peace we live in a world of chaos and uncertainty and I think more than anything, I believe more than anything, we need to understand how to have true peace. And that peace comes from, as we will study, comes from knowing Christ. And so we want to take time to look into this by God's grace. I pray you're ready to study and that you have your Bibles. I suggest that you read the book Steps to Christ. Steps to Christ this is where we glean a lot of what we're going to be studying this evening. Steps to Christ. And we're going to use that, uh, use a lot of references from this book throughout this series. So let us at this time have a word of prayer and ask that the Holy Spirit will be with us in our study this evening. Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for this opportunity we have to look into your word. And as we prepare to dive into it, we ask that you will give us understanding and that you will show us, not only tonight, but throughout this series, how we can have peace, how we can find a path to peace. Bless every person who's listening. Guide us through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, we're in a new series entitled The Path to Life Series. The Path to Life Series. I, I, I did say uh, the path to peace, but it's actually the path to life. But peace, life, we're dealing with the same thing. And we're taking a biblical, we're looking at a biblical look at a how to be brought into a deeper experience with Jesus. Tonight, we're talking about how deep the Father's love for us. That's our message this evening. How deep the Father's love for us. Now, how was God's love revealed? We're going to Psalm 145. We want to really take time to look at the love of God. Psalm 145. Starting at verse 15. Psalm 145. Starting at verse 15, how is God's love revealed? The Bible says, the eyes of all wait upon thee. Thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest thine hand and satisfies the desire of what? Every living thing. How is God's love revealed? Because he's a God that supplies all of our needs. He's a God that supplies the need of every living thing, the Bible says. So God's love is revealed to, to all through nature. We see it also in nature. His love is revealed through nature and revelation. His love is shown not only to man, but to all of God's created beings. Now, what has sin brought upon God's creation? Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Again, we see God's love shown through nature in Revelation. We see his love shown in being a God who cares and supplies all of our needs. But what has sin brought upon God's creation? Genesis 3, verse 17. Notice what the Bible says. Genesis 3, starting at verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face, thou shalt eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. 
Now, from the very beginning, when God created everything, the when you, when you when you when we look at the earth, like for example, the the mountains, the mountains were not rugged and jagged like the a lot of the mountains that we see today. They were like big giant hills. The roses didn't have thorns on them. They were smooth, bright colors, bright red, pink, yellow, etc., white. But, but as a result of seeing those roses now got thorns on them. However, the beautiful thing about it is, as we will study, we'll see this, even though those roses have thorns on them, those roses still speak to us of God's love. The beauty of their rules is still apparent. But let's look at some more scripture here. We're going to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 20 through 22. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of men, children of God, excuse me. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. So all creation is in travail and groans in pain. Why? Because of sin. Sin has brought a, a, a stain upon God's creation. However, once again, even though these uh, blemishes and spots are apparent in God's creation, however, we still see the beauty of God's creation. We still, the creation still speaks to us of God's love. Isaiah 24, looking at verse 5 through 6. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have what? Transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore have to curse did what to the earth, devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of earth are burned, and few men are left. So, so sin has brought a blight upon God's creation. So sin has brought woe. Sin has brought pain and sickness and death upon God's creation. What is sin? Sin, according to 1 John 3, 4, is the transgression or violation of God's law. Now, how does the Bible describe God's character? Because again, creation reveals to us God's love. And even though sin has marred God's creation, creation still speaks to us of God's love. Now, love, we will see, is one of the attributes of God's character. But let's look at some more concerning God's character. How does the Bible describe God's character? Exodus 33, 18 through 19. The Bible says, And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. This is Moses speaking to God. He's asking God, Lord, I beg you, show me your glory. Verse 19. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and will, I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Now, Moses asked God, Lord, I beseech thee, or I beg you, show me your glory. God says, okay, I will proclaim my name. Now, that word name in the original Hebrew means authority, and it also means not only reputation, but it also means character. Character. Exodus 34. Exodus 34. Flip on over to Exodus 34. 5 through 6, the Bible says, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name or character of the Lord. Verse 6, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that were by no means clearly guilty, 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. And then, of course, we read in Jonah 4, verse 2, and it says, And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I, when I was yet in my country? He's, he, you know, God showed mercy un, uh, unto the uh, inhabitants of Nineveh. And so Jonah is upset because he said, Within 40 days, Nineveh shall be destroyed and nothing happened. Why? Because the people repented and turned from their evil ways. And because of that, you know, Jonah, he's very upset. And he says, and he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore, I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a what? Gracious God and what? merciful and what slow to anger and what else and of great kindness and what and repentance deed of evil God was trying to teach Jonah a lesson why because Jonah was a hard preacher Jonah was one who preached condemnation but he would not preach the hope of salvation God was trying to teach him a lesson he said look God was trying to teach him like look you see, these people, they, they are turning. They, they are turning from their sins. They are repenting. They are repenting in sackcloth and ashes. They are fasting and prayer. Something that, I, that, that is very hard for my own professed people to do. And they're doing it. These individuals who, who basically don't have the knowledge of truth that you have. And they hear this message that within 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed and they turn and re from their sin and put sackcloth on themselves. God says, look, I am a merciful God. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I want them to turn from their evil ways and live. God was trying to teach Jonah a lesson. And he had a hard time, hard time receiving this lesson. God calls a a, 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 a tree to come up to give a bush or a tree to come up to kind of give Jonah some shade. And Jonah loved it. But then all of a sudden God caused a worm to eat it. And that thing withered and died. And God sent an east wind and it was hot. He was, Oh, Oh, oh whoa, man. I, I just, I just need, I just want to die. God is like, what's wrong with you? What happened to this plant? He was like, you say you show, you're showing more concern over this plant, but what about all these souls in Nineveh? God was trying to teach Jonah a lesson about his, his, his character, his love for man. God is gracious. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. He's of great kindness and repenteth him of evil. In Micah 7, verse 18, the Bible says, Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever. Why? Because he delighteth in what? Mercy. God delights in mercy. The Bible tells us in, in 2 Peter that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But it's long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come. But it hasn't come yet. Why? Because he's long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that individuals, men and women, boys and girls will turn from their evil ways, turn from sin, that they will have an opportunity to hear the hope of salvation. God delights in mercy. But so many of us, especially some who claim to have this truth, don't delight in mercy. We delight in condemnation. And that, my friend, is not the spirit of God. Psalm 103, verse 8, the Bible says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and what? Plenteous in mercy. This is God. 1 John 4, 8 says, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. If you don't love, you don't know God. 
That's what the Bible says. If you have spite or hatred in your heart against another person, you don't, you don't know God. Why? Because God is love. And if you are loving, you know God. If you don't have that love of God in your heart, you don't know him because in order for us to have this love, we can't do it in our own strength. It is by beholding Christ, by studying his word and reading it and receiving it that we become changed. But so many of us are content in remaining the same. Now, going back to Exodus chapter 33, verse 18 and Exodus 34, verse 5, the word name means character. Despite man's failure, God is a God of love mercy and grace. He is not willing that any should perish. Second Peter two verse nine. Yet Satan, the enemy of God and man has put out false charges about God and his character. The Bible proves Satan to be false. Now, this is very important. God had to do something to refute the false charges of Satan. And this plan that he had was from the foundation of the world. Now, what did God do to remove the dark shadow that Satan has placed on the minds of men concerning his character? We're going to John 1 verse 18. John 1 verse 18. John 1 verse 18. The Bible says, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him. Another word for declare would be he proclaimed or he manifest or revealed. Go to Matthew 11, verse 27. So the son of God came to declare who the father is. Matthew 11. And we're going to look at verse 27. The Bible says, and they came and they come again to Jerusalem and they come again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, excuse me, that's the wrong one. I'm reading Mark. Matthew 11, here we go. Matthew 11, verse 27. All things are delivered unto me of my father and no man knoweth the son, but the what? Father, neither knoweth any man the father save the who? Son, and he to whomsoever the son will reveal him. So Jesus knew, he, he, he said, nobody knows the father except me. And so he came to reveal the father. No one's seen the father at any time except Jesus. But according to what he was, was saying, we read in, in, in John and also in Matthew, he's like, look, he basically said, I came to reveal the father, to show you his character. As a matter of fact, go to John 14 verses eight and nine. This is exactly what Jesus told Philip. John 14 Verses eight and nine, the Bible says, Philip said unto him, said unto Jesus, Lord, show us the father and it sufficeth us. Jesus said unto him, have I not so long time? Have I been so long time with you? And yet thou has not known me, Philip. He that have seen me have seen the father. And I'll say what thou did, show us the father. So if you've seen Christ, you see the father. So when we look at the character of Christ and we see his love and what he did throughout his life here on the earth, it's, it's a revelation to us of the character of God. Now, what was the mission of Jesus and is still his mission? Luke 14, uh, Luke 4, Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Luke 4. Verse 18, the Bible says this in Luke four, verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is what Jesus says. 
The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he have anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. So Christ came to help the poor. He came to heal the brokenhearted. He came to give deliverance to the captives. He came to recover sight to the blind, not only the physically blind, but also the spiritual blind. He came to set at liberty them that are bruised. That's what Christ came to do. And he's still in that business today. Matthew 20, verse 28. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. The Bible says this. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Christ came to not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. He bought us with his blood. Now, how did Jesus come into the world? Let's look at it. We need to understand what Christ laid on the line for us. Philippians 2 verses 5 through 8 says, let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus. The Bible says, let it, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Don't resist, don't fight it. Allow the way Christ lived be your experience. Allow the way he thinks be your experience. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. What does that mean? Thought it not robber to be equal with God. The Bible says when you when you look in the original he, the original Greek that he didn't consider being God a thing to be grasped. He didn't consider it something he was trying to obtain. Why? Because he already had it. The Bible tells us in John chapter one. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So it wasn't something he was trying to obtain. He didn't think it robber to be equal with God because he already was equal with God. Verse seven says, but he made himself of no reputation. You're talking about one who was up in, in, in glory, one who the angels prostrated and fell before him saying, holy, holy, holy. He made himself of no reputation, king of glory, wearing many crowns, has a throne, laid it all on the line, made himself of no reputation, the Bible says and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he did what? He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. This is what Jesus did for us. Go to Romans 8, verses 3 and 4. He laid a lot on the line for you and I. The same mind that Jesus had, we are to have a selfless mind, not selfish, selfless. He laid it all on the line for you and I. Romans 8. And we're going to look at verses 3 and 4. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sent in his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And what did he do when he came in our sinful flesh? Because we have a group that believed that Christ did not come in our sinful flesh, but he came in sinless flesh. That's not scripture. The Bible says that he came in sinful flesh. And what did he do in this sinful flesh? The Bible goes on to say, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Why? For what purpose? Verse four, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. He came not only to declare the father, to reveal the character of the father, but also he came to be our example. And he lived a sinless life in his, in this sinful flesh to demonstrate that as we are connected to him, just like he, when he was walking this earth, was connected to the Father, we can have victory. So Jesus demonstrated throughout his life, love, compassion, long-suffering, pity, and forgiveness to men. 
He was God in the flesh. According to 1 Timothy 3, verse 16, God in the flesh. God with us. Given a demonstration, revealing practically the love of God for man. Now, what ordeal did Jesus have to go through to save us? We read part of it in Philippians chapter 2. But now we want to go to the Old Testament, Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Notice Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 5. Notice what the Bible says here. Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 5. The Bible says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He have no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces for, from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was a man of sorrows, acquaint, acquainted with grief. Do you realize how painful it was for Jesus to walk around in this sinful flesh? Do you, know, do you understand how painful it was for Jesus to, to, to see the results and the works of sin? It was painful. Imagine walking inside of a... I mean, it was... It was not only painful, it not only, it, you know, it was sorrowful to him to see how low Satan has brought man, but it, I, I can describe it this way. It's, it's like it was a stench to him. Imagine walking into a room and it just smells so bad that it makes you sick. That's how Jesus felt about sin. But he endured all of that for you and I so that we could have life. He left his father's throne to endure all this for you and I. To be, to be despised and rejected of men. How do you think that made Jesus feel? feel? To be despised and rejected. But verse five says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Mark 15 verse 15 tells us about these stripes. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, why? Because he was a time server. Why? Because he was a coward. Knowing the man was innocent. He said, he is innocent, but I will scourge him and then let him go. The people saw the weakness, especially the Jewish leaders. They saw the weakness of Pilate and they took advantage of the situation. They still you know Pilate is just turning them over and saying, look, my hands are clean. My hands are clean. Uh, I am not guilty of this man's blood. If you let this man go, you're not Caesar's friend. You're no friend of Caesar. Oh, he was afraid of that. Ooh, I need my job. I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to lose my honors. And so, willing to content the people. Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas, a murderer a thief unto them and delivered Jesus when he has scourged him to be crucified. By the way, as a side note, what all that Pilate feared, losing his job, losing his honors, it, all, it happened to him. What he feared was what he got. If he would have stood for principle and truth, perhaps he wouldn't have to go through that a uh, terrible ordeal he went through later. He was stripped of his honors and in the end he took his own life only to rise up again in the judgment 
How sad, friends. But the Bible says he was scourged. Jesus was scourged. That word scourge in the original Greek, when you look it up, it's, it uses the word flagellum. That's what it means, scourge. F flagellum. The flagrum was designed to quickly, this, this, this thing that was used to scourge Jesus, it was designed to quickly remove the flesh from the body of the victim. We're, we're looking at what Jesus did for you and I, what he had to go through in order to save you and I. The flagrum was designed to quickly remove the flesh from the body of the victim. This was used for severe punishment. The flesh was cut by the whips made with leather throngs, knotted with a number of small pieces of metal, usually zinc and iron attached at various intervals. Sometimes the Roman scourge contained a hook at the end and was given the terrifying name Scorpion. This was used for criminals. Jesus, in order to save us, went through the experience of being treated like a criminal. This thing was used for criminals. It says deep lacerations, torn flesh, exposed muscles would leave the criminal half dead. And this right here, you can see on the picture, this is pretty much how the victim had to carry the cross. Of course, they, they didn't carry the whole cross, but scholars reveal that this pad pabulum, that's what it's called, the pabulum, the, they had to carry that. And then, of course, you have this the the uh, the um, the other part of the cross that was already that was uh, put in once they would nail or tie this paddling part to it, and uh, of course after getting beaten, that thing was pretty heavy. The weight of it was was intense. Archaeological data indicate that the specific nails used during the time of Christ's crucifixion were tapered iron spikes, five to seven inches long with a square shaft approximately three eighths of an inch across. The weight of the body would tear quite easily through the lumbricals and the flexor tendons, breaking the metacarpal bones as the nails pulled free, allowing the body to fall to the earth. Christ went through excruciating pain physically to save us. And of course, those nails, those spikes didn't go through the actual hand. It didn't go through the actual hand. It went right here in the wrist area. Because if it went through the hand, it would have easily tore, but it went right here in this area as you can see in the picture. However, in ancient terminology, the wrist was considered to be part of the hand. Excuse me. The wrist was considered to be part of the hand. At the base of the wrist bones, the strong fibrous band of the flexor reticulum binds down the flexor tendons. Iron spikes driven through the flexor recticulum easily could have passed through the bony elements and held the weight of the arm. This location would require that the nail be placed through either the space between the radius and carpal bones or between the two rows of the carpal bones. It was very excruciating. And, and by the way, uh, it was right between those bones and also, uh, nerves and so it was very it was right there next to it and so it was very painful sharp pain the pain Christ must have experienced up to this point would have been excruciating 
And yet the Roman soldiers were about to deliver even more. There were many ways to nail the feet to the, st to the stipes, but most required the knees to be flexed and relocated laterally. It is likely that the, that the spikes were driven through either the tarsal metatarsal joint between the metatarsal bones and the cuneiform bones or the transverse tarsal joint between the calconius and the cupoid or navicular bones. While the placement undoubtedly would prevent the bones of Christ's feet from breaking, it nevertheless would cause severe injury to deep perineal nerve or lateral plantar nerve and artery and certainly would pierce the, the quadrudos plantae muscle. That's the reference right there. You can look this up and verify all this information. It will not be uncommon by this time for insects. Listen, brother, this we're talking about the, the pain and the experience of Christ on that cross, what he went through to save you and I. And we don't even appreciate it. It would not be uncommon by this time for insects to barrel into the open wounds or orifices such as the nose, mouth, ears, and eyes of a crucified victim. So imagine the insect burrowing into the skin and you can't swat at it to remove it because your arms are nailed to the cross. Gnats flying all in your eye, flies all in your face, and you can't swat them. Insects burrowing into those stripes on his back, on his side. Crawling all in and he can't do anything. Additionally, birds of prey frequently were known to feed off the tattered wounds. Isn't that amazing? Victim in, in, it wasn't completely dead yet. And the birds would begin to, to feed off frequently on those tattered wounds. It was di in disposition with his previous blood seeping down the cross that Christ uttered the amazing statement while all these insects are burrowing into his skin while he is on that cross and he has to pull himself up in order to get a breath, a complete full breath. But other than that, when he sunk down like this in his regular position, <laughs> he can't even breathe. And so as he's saying what he's getting ready to say in this paragraph here, he rises up after going through all this experience and says, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. He went through all that for you. While you still playing around with your sin, while you still talking about others behind their back, while you still snorting up the cocaine, while you still smoking that crack rock, while you still rolling up that blunt, while you still turning up on that alcohol or that gray goose or Jack Daniels, drown, trying to drown your sorrows, not even realizing that the man of sorrows who is acquainted with your grief, touched with the feelings of your infirmities, he is, he went through all this to save you. He went through all this to give you hope. The hope of a better world, the hope of eternal life. And we take what he did for granted. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Even though blood poured from the lacerated back on major pathophysiological impairment, one major pathophysiological impairment Jesus faced during the crucifixion was normal respiration, breathing. I just talked about that. Maximum inhalation would have been possible 
only when the body weight was supported by the nailed wrist of the outstretched arms. When Christ first was lifted unto the splintered covered surface of the cross, his arms and body were stretched out in the form of a Y. And you can see right here in that position, as you see on this picture, the, the twisting and the displacement that it put right here on his lungs. And in order for him to get a full breath, he had to rise himself up. The momentary T position would be required to allow proper support of inhalation. Thus, in order to breathe, he was required to lift his body using his nail wrist for leverage. Inhalation would be impossible, exhalation, excuse me, would be impossible in this position and the immense pain placed on the wrist quickly would become too great. Therefore, Christ would have to slump back into a wide position to exhale. Jesus would be forced to continue alternating between the Y and T position with every breath, trying all the while not to reopen the wounds he had received from the scourging. Fatigued muscles eventually would begin to spasm and Christ would become exhausted, exhausted from these repeated tasks, slumping permanently into the shape of a Y. In this position, chest and respiratory muscles soon would become paralyzed from the increased strain and pain. Without strength for breath, Christ's body will begin to suffer from asphyxia. He went through all this for you and I. What wondrous love. Look at that. In order to inhale, he had to be in this Y position. To exhale, he had to raise himself up. And talking was very difficult. All that on that cross put pressure on the heart of Jesus. But looking at all the pain and different things he experienced, what was it that caused Jesus to die on that cross? Was it the nails in his hands? and his feet? Was it the intense scourging that he received? Was it the pressure being in that position that he was in? Was it the pressure that it placed on his body, his, his lungs, his respiratory, his heart? Was it that? Was it those things alone? What was it that caused the death of Jesus on that cross? Luke 23, Luke 23. We need to understand the depth of the Father's love. And he demonstrated that love through his son. Luke 23, looking at verse 46. The Bible says, and he said unto them, why sleep ye? Excuse me. Luke 23, verse 46. Here we go. And, it, and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into my thy hands, I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost, meaning he died. John 19. And let me say this. Humanity died. Jesus as the son of man died. But as divinity, as the son of God, he didn't die. Divinity didn't die. Humanity died, but divinity did not die. Divinity cannot die. It was humanity that died. I want to make that very clear. John 19, verse 31 through 34, the Bible says, the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate, that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the, came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus 
and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came what? Came there out blood and water. Very important to note. We'll come back to that in just in, in a little bit. But I find it very interesting that those Jews, those Jewish leaders were such, they were trying to hurry up and get those bodies off the cross for the Sabbath. Yet they killed the Lord of the Sabbath. They wanted to hurry up and kill Jesus because they hated him so much and get him off the cross because they wanted to be ready for the Sabbath. In order for one to keep the Sabbath holy, one must themselves be holy. They didn't truly keep the Sabbath holy. Psalm 69. Psalm 69. And we're going to look at verses 20 through 21. Psalm 69. Psalm 69, 20 through 21. The Bible says, reproach have broken my heart. What happened? Reproach have broken my heart. I am, and I am full of heaviness and I look for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall for my meat. And in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. That's what they did to Jesus. This is a messianic prophecy. They gave Jesus vinegar to drink. They gave him gall. The Bible says reproach have broken my heart. Jesus, friend, died of a broken heart. Matthew 27. Matthew 27. Starting at verse 50, reading verse 50, it says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. He cried with a loud voice. And I imagine that voice being a voice of pain. He just, ah! and gave up the ghost. Now you got to put all these gospels together. Yeah, he said, into thy hands I commend my spirit. But you line it up with another gospel. The Bible says he cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. It was a cry of pain. He went through that for you and I. Jesus, Jesus' heart was broken by the sin of the world. Let's let that sink in. Due to the shallow breathing, the victim's lungs began to collapse in small areas causing hypoxia and hypercapnia, hypercapnia, a respiratory acidosis with lack of compensation by kidneys due to the loss of blood from the numerous beatings resulted in the increased strain on the heart, which beats faster to compensate after several hours the heart begins to fail, the lungs collapse, collapse and fill up with fluid, which further decreases oxygen delivered to the tissues. But you may say, what, what? He, he died because of that. No, he died in a broken heart, according to the scriptures. If that's the case, all those individuals who were nailed on the cross along with Jesus, they would have died also. They were still alive. Jesus was dead already, the Bible says in the Gospel of John. They had to break the legs of those two thieves that were on the cross because they were still alive. Yes, the results, the, the, uh, the, the effects of, on that cross had those things that we read about, that we're reading about here, but they were still alive. Christ had died already. You're talking about Christ, not some flimsy looking man that we see in some of these uh, art artist depictions like Michelangelo and Leonardo. No, he was a carpenter. You ever seen a carpenter before? They got strong arms. These are strong individuals. I've seen carpenters in their 70s doing push-ups, run circles around these young men we see today. He was a strong man. And matter of fact, he was in his prime, 33 years old. Strong man. He wasn't some weakling. He was strong, and yet he died before the other, the other individuals who were on the cross. It was a broken heart. After several hours, it says, 
The heart begins to fail, the lungs collapse and fill up with fluid, which further decreases oxygen, oxygen delivery to the tissues. The blood loss and hyperventilation combines to cause the severe dehydration. And that's why when Christ was on the cross, he said, I thirst. Why? Because this loss of blood came from the beating and the nails and all those different things. And the hyperventilation, you know, being in that position on the cross caused severe dehydration. And therefore, Christ, when he was on the cross, he said, I thirst. Over the period of several hours, the combination of collapsing lungs, a failing heart, dehydration, and the inability to get adequate oxygen supplies to the tissues caused the eventual death of the victim. The victim, in effect, cannot breathe properly and slowly suffocates to death. In cases of severe cardiac stress, such as crucifixion, a victim's heart can even burst. This process is called cardiac rupture. Jesus suffered hours of limitless pain, cycles of twisting, joint rending cramps, intermediate partial asphation, and searing pain as tissue was torn from his lacerated back from his movement up and down against the rough timbers of the cross. Imagine he was getting splinters probably in his back. Then another agony began, a deep crushing pain in the chest as the pericardium, the sac surrounding the heart, slowly filled with serum and began to compress the heart. All of these things that Christ experienced on the cross, they had a a major contribution to his death, no doubt about it. But again, those other two prisoners, they were still living. Christ had died already. It was a broken heart, according to the scriptures. That sped the process of his death. Desire of Ages, page 772, paragraph 2. But it was not the spear thrust. It was not the pain of the cross that caused the death of Jesus. That cry uttered with a loud voice. At the moment of death, the stream of blood and water that flowed from his side declared that he died of a broken heart. His heart was broken by mental anguish. He, he was slain by the sin of the world. But by your sin, by my sin, the sin of of the whole world. That Desire of Ages, page 753, paragraph 2 says, Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Imagine Satan whispering in his ear, and he's using these various Jews and, and Jewish leaders. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross and we'll believe you, for you said you was the Son of God. If God will have you, said you were the son of God. If you were the son of God, come down from the cross. Even the prisoners that are on the cross, if, if you were the son of God, save yourself and us. Satan, using his fierce temptations to wring at the heart of Jesus. Oh, you die there? If you die, there's no guarantee that this plan will work. If you die, you may not be able to go beyond the portals of the tomb. The Savior could not see. We're talking about Jesus as the Son of Man now. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of his father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their, eternity, that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. He went through that so you don't have to deal with it. He experienced the full wrath of Almighty God so that you don't have to deal with it. It was the sense of sin bringing the father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that 
made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the son of God. Now, was Jesus sacrifice made in order to increase or create in the father's heart love for man? The Bible says in John three, verse 16 to 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why did he give his son? To increase love in his heart for man? No, because he already loved man. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent out his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Let's go to another scripture. Second Corinthians five. As a matter of fact, yeah, let's go there. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 19. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 19. Notice what the Bible says here. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto what? Himself, not imputing their trespasses un unto them and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So we have a work to do. Once we have experienced this salvation that Christ offers to us, that God offers to us through his son, Jesus Christ, we are also with the message of salvation, which Jonah should have done in giving that preaching of, of Nineveh being destroyed in 40 days, which he didn't do. He talked about the, he, he talked about the condemnation, but he didn't give the hope of salvation. He didn't tell them what he knew about God being merciful, about God being long suffering, and that if they would turn from their evil ways, that he would have mercy and that they would live. He didn't preach that. He just said, within 40 days, the liver shall be destroyed. Just like the Father through Jesus reconciled us to him. We have a work to do in reconciling a lost world. Why? By, how? By giving the everlasting gospel to those who are in darkness so that they can be reconciled to God. Once you, once you have, if you have experienced the salvation that Christ offers, you can't keep it to yourself. The Bible says he has committed unto you and I the ministry or the word of reconciliation. We have a work to do. We have a work to do. How long are we going to continue to sit back and be entertained by different events? Church events. Churches has become a, a, a social club. It's time for us to stop just having church and be the church. We make up for our lack of love for humanity by having activities. Preaching to ourselves programs, having programs. We want to be in church all day. Where is that in the council? We want to be in there all day, entertaining ourselves and looking at the world events and all this other stuff. When there's a world out there that is lost. So again, we make up for our lack of love for humanity by replacing it with programs for ourselves. It's time for us to wake up. It's time for a true revival and reformation. Let's look at some more here as we begin to wind this down. John 10, verse 17, John 10, verse 17. Some individuals, they, they feel like that they, they need to, they, they, that the preacher is to do all the work and they themselves are to sit there in the congregation and just be consumers, not even realizing that God has called you also like the preacher to be a producer. Each one of us has a soul to win. Each one of us has a work that we can do. But so many of us, preachers and, men, and people alike, we're, we'd rather be consumers instead of being producers. 
It's time for us to wake up, brothers and sisters. You want to know a sign of a dead, dying church? A church that just want a pastor or a minister or evangelist to just wait upon them without them themselves, the individuals stepping up to the plate and you utilizing the gifts that God has given them. That's why we told ministers are not to hover over the churches. We got too many ministers today just hovering over the churches. I can show, I can show dark areas where there's no present truth presence, no lighthouse that must be raised up. Ministers are content hovering over the churches. People are content in being consumers and not producers. Don't worry, the pastor will do it. A sign of a dead or dying church is a church that is dependent upon a minister to hover over them instead of being dependent upon Christ through his spirit to hover over them and not just hover over them, but be in them and work through them. It's time for us to wake up. Where is the self-sacrificing love that we see in Christ? Where is the self-sacrificing love that we see even through the Father in giving his son to the human race? This is why we have to go back to the basics. Because many of us who should be on advanced meet, we're still children. We got heads and faces of grown-ups, but bodies of little children. We, 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 something is off. And so we got to go back to the basics here. Something is lacking in the experience, especially among those who claim to believe present truth. There's a lack, there's head knowledge, but there's no practical experience. It's time for us to Really examine ourselves and compare our lives with the life of Christ and see what's missing. We don't need a renovation. We need conversion, transformation. That's what we need. John, 7, John 10, verse 17. The Bible says, therefore, doth my father love me because I laid down my life that I may take it up again. He, take it up again. He laid down his life. For you and I, brothers and sisters. Steps to Christ, page 13, paragraph 2 says, But this great sacrifice was not made in order to create in the Father's heart a love for man, not to make him willing to save. No, no. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, John 3, verse 16. The Father loves us not because of the great propitiation, but he provided the propitiation because he loves us. Christ was the medium through which he could pour out his infinite love upon a fallen world. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. God suffered with his son in the agony of Gethsemane, the death of Calvary. The heart of infinite love paid the price for our redemption. Now, what did the death of Christ, the death of Jesus provide for us? Romans Three verses 23 to 26. We need to follow the example of Jesus. We need to lay down our lives. We need to not love. We have to not love our lives unto the death. We have to be self-sacrificing like the father. Willing to give his only begotten son. Would you give your son for a race that you knew would not even appreciate it? Would you give your son to be sped upon? To be blindfolded and then punched in the face, prophesied, prophet, who hit you next? Would you send your son to a world knowing that, that, that the same mouth that he formed, the same throat and nostrils and nasals, the, the, the nasal cavities that he formed would hawk and spit right in his face. And the spit just runs and drips down his beard. Would you send your son to go on such a, 
unpromising errand? We're talking about self-sacrificing love. This is what the Father has done. And yet so many of us don't even appreciate it. We continue on in our sin in our own lives and we don't even have a love or burden for souls. Again, we make up for our lack as a church in feeding ourselves and being consumers and not producers to being sitting down always Christians instead of being Seventh-day Adventist Christians or Christians a movement of believers like we see in the book of Acts. That's why it's called Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. The book of Acts is a book of action, not just words, not just sermons, not just theories, but reality. And we got to get back to that. It, God will bring his church back to this. But the question is, will you be a part of it? We're looking at self-sacrificing love. We're looking at the death of the father's love. And if we don't have the love of God in our hearts, if we don't love, we don't know God. Because in order to love, we must know him. Brothers and sisters, I hope you're understanding this tonight. Romans 3, verse 23, the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all miss the mark. That's what it means, come short. We've missed the mark of obtaining or, uh, or in perfecting God's character, his glory. We've all missed the mark. We've all missed the bullseye. But the Bible says being justified freely, doesn't cost you anything, freely, by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Christ paid for it already. Whom God has set forth to be the propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Christ's death provided justification for you, for you and our brothers and sisters. Can Jesus truly identify himself with the interests and needs of man? Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to wind this down. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Powerful passage here. It says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Talking about one who was ruler over the angels. He made himself a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all are all of one for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Verse 12. I'll skip on, let's look at verses 14 through 18. Let's skip verses 14 to 18. He says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he made, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to, make, to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. Now to be just a little lower than the angels, that was a great humility on his part, but he went even you know, further than that, taking upon himself the seed of Abraham, sinful nature. Hebrews 4, 15 through 16, the Bible says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, 
but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He was tempted like we are tempted, but he did not sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There's grace to help. How deep is God's love for us? Isaiah 49 verse 15 says, Can a woman forget her sucking child? That she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet I will not. Yet will I not forget thee. God said, I'm not going to forget you. I love you. I sent my son to save you. You have a faithful high priest who was touched with the feelings of your infirmities. All points tempted like as you are, yet without sin. And so you can come boldly, Jesus even says, you can come boldly unto the throne of grace and find grace to help in time of need. I want to help you. I know what you're going through. I'm here to help you. I am your elder brother. But God says, the father even says, they may forget you. A mother, we know a mother won't forget a suckling child. If she's in her right mind, of course, she's not going to forget her suckling child. But God says, they may forget you, but I will never forget you. That's strong love right there. That's deeper than a mother's love. When I look at my child in that crib, my 20, 21 month old, my heart yearns for that child. So what about God? Just like a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. He loves you. His love is deeper than a father's love. The price paid for our redemption, the infinite sacrifice of our heavenly father and giving his son to die for us should give us exalted conceptions of what we may become through Christ. As the inspired apostle, John beheld the height, the death, and the breadth of the father's love toward the perishing race. He was filled with adoration and reverence and failing to find suitable language in which to express the greatness and tenderness of this love, he called upon the world to behold it. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. 1 John 3, 1. What a value this places upon man. Through transgression, the sons of man become subjects of Satan. Through faith in the atoning sacrifice of Christ, the sons of Adam may become the sons of God. By assuming human nature, Christ elevates humanity. Fallen men are placed where through connection with Christ, they may indeed become worthy of the name sons of God. Steps of Christ, page 15, paragraph two. Such love is without, without a parallel. Children of the heavenly king, precious promise, theme for the most profound meditation, the matchless love for a, for, uh, of God for a world that did not love him. The thought has a subduing power upon the soul and brings the mind into captivity to the will of God. The more we study the divine character in the light of the cross, in the light of the cross, the more we see mercy, tenderness, and forgiveness blended with equity and justice. And the more clearly we discern innumerable evidences, evidences of a love that is infinite and a tender pity surpassing a mother's yearning sympathy for her wayward child. That's how deep the love of God is. So deep that even though sin caused a separation between us and God, sin that is offensive to God, sin that just like something that stinks, reaches his nostrils, it makes him sick. He yet went on an expensive errand through his son, Jesus Christ. And because of the reason why he did that is because nothing, even though sin causes a separation from God, nothing will separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So even though sin causes that separation, 
Sin as offensive as it is to God, when we come to him in faith and say, Lord, please save me, he will come and save us. Save us from sin. Do you want that to be your experience? Are you tired of, 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 of dibbling, dipping and dabbling in sin? Are you tired of having the in and out experience? Do you, do, do you understand God's love for you? Do you understand how deep it is? So deep that he's not willing that you should perish. That if you will turn from your evil ways and live, if you will turn from your sin, if you will lay that sin at the foot of Jesus, he'll save you. Do you want to experience the salvation? that is found only in Jesus. Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of Jesus, thanking you for your word. We thank you for you sending your son Jesus to save us. And Lord, forgive us for where we have not appreciated such an expensive sacrifice. You sacrifice all of heaven, basically to save us. And so Lord, we thank you. We ask Father that you will save us, cleanse us from all sin, mold and shape us in what you will have us to be. May we cease from just having church, but may we be the church. May we be what you're calling us to be. Help us, Lord. We can't do it in our own strength. We need your divine power working within us. I pray for every listener. Help us to surrender all to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have any topic or question, please comment below. Thank you for your prayers and continued support.